Hi guys, uh, Pastor Greg Corcoran here from Battlefield Baptist Church. Uh, pray that this sermon is a blessing and encouragement and a challenge to you in your walk with the Lord. Additionally, I just wanted to say that if we here at Battlefield can ever be a blessing to you, please don't hesitate to contact us. And the best way to do that is through our website at battlefieldbaptist.org. Again, I pray this sermon blesses you, encourages you, and uh, that you'll fall more in love with God, more in love with His Word, and more in love with people. Well, praise the Lord for the Father's love, amen, that sent His Son to this world for you and me and for the sins of the world. If you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, and man, it's good to see you. We had a wonderful, wonderful week last week, and Praise the Lord for the many decisions that were made, and uh, it was just good to be in God's house, right? And I pray that you've had a great week this week. It's been a little chilly, so I'm still looking forward to warmer temperatures. I know we have a lot of our families out on spring break and whatnot, and so um, hopefully they were uh, enjoying warmer temperatures somewhere, but uh, anyway, uh, it is good to be in the Lord's house today. Luke chapter 24 and I uh, want to talk to you on this subject of opening the eyes of my heart. And uh, certainly an incredibly important topic this morning. I won't keep you long. Uh, but uh, if you're like me, if you're here this morning, you're like me, I'm guessing there have been times when you're not able to see something. In fact, have you ever had an op a time when you actually had something in your hand and you didn't even know that it was there? Anybody ever done that, or is it just me because I'm getting older? It's just me, okay. I, I seriously, it's strange, but it can happen. I remember on one occasion, I was, I was here at the, uh, at the church facility, and I was running around frantic. I had lost, watch this, I had air quote lost my cell phone. Anybody ever lost your cell phone? Okay, has anybody lost your cell phone already this morning? Right? So I had lost my cell phone and it was crazy. Nobody else was here. I'm running around like the village idiot. I'm in the sanctuary. I'm looking through all the pews, although I had never been in that pew or section. I'm looking at the piano. I'm looking here. I'm looking everywhere for my phone. I, you know, <clears throat> I had put uh, the uh, praise team books out that week. And so I went up to the media room. I'm looking in the media room. I'm looking in the office. I go to the gym. I'm walking around the gym. I am literally frantic. I have lost my cell phone. I go and I pull my car up right here by the curb and I start looking through the car. I start, anybody ever done that? I'm looking through the car. I'm like, maybe it fell out of my pocket and it's caught in between, you know, the console and the seat or maybe the door and the seat. And, and it gets so bad that I call Krista, who's at home. I'm asking her to help me find my phone. I'm literally standing outside. I'm like, I don't even know where my phone is. I'm looking everywhere for my phone. I've been going frantically all over the church. And then I, and then I literally was like, hello? It was in my back pocket the whole time. I had, I had slid it. In fact, I buttoned my pocket today because I didn't want to do that. I, I, it was in my back the, the whole time. And I'm literally frantic. And the, the reason that it, like the light bulb went off is because when my car is on and I'm on my phone, all of a sudden something happens and then it comes through the speakers on the phone, on the car. And so I'm like, hold on a second. Hold on. It must be here in the car. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, dummy. It was in the car. It was in your hand. I'm guessing... I'm guessing there have been times in your life as well as my life in the midst of trials and testings and even temptations when we just couldn't see or sense the Lord's presence. Have you ever been there? Had times when you're like, where are you, Lord? Lord, I need you, but I... I Lord... 
Interestingly enough, we're in Luke chapter 24 this morning. I believe that this is exactly what it was like for some of the Lord's followers early on. Early on, right after uh, his death, his burial, and even after his proclaimed resurrection, there was, there was, there was, there was confusion. It, it was as if they couldn't see, they couldn't sense the Lord's presence. And so uh, this morning, I just want us to look at a, a, a short passage of Scripture, a, a simple story, but really, we're just going to walk our way through the story. There's not like three points in a poem. There's not five quotes from great speakers and, and everything. We're just going to walk through the story. And then at the end, Lord willing, I'm, I'm just going to make a quick note. And I pray that it's going to be a blessing and a challenge to each of us, okay? And so look with me in Luke chapter 24 because in verse number 5, you can get into verse number 5. The reality is that we know from the resurrection story last week that the angels, they actually speak to the ladies. They come to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. And then here in Luke, number, uh, Luke 24 and verse number 5, notice the angel says, Why seek ye the living among the dead? In verse number 60, you go on and they say, He is not here, but is risen. And we got excited about that, amen? amen. We're excited that the angel said, He's not here, He's risen. But notice there was still a great confusion. There's discouragement, there's doubt, there's unbelief had set in uh, following his death. And go down, drop down further, because in verse number 11, the women, although they've shared the news of Jesus' uh, supposed resurrection, right? The angels told them he's not here, he's risen. They're looking at the tomb just like you and I would be looking at the tomb. They had brought spices to anoint the body of Jesus, and so they're confused at what's going on. And so in look at verse number 11, they, they share the news with the apostles, and then the Bible says, though, that their words, after they shared them, that their words seemed to them as idle tales. Watch this. And they believed them not. Let me just say something on the very offset, and I don't make the rules, but in this day and age, ladies, a woman's testimony was not really highly regarded. It was not really highly regarded, and so that, that plays into to the details of the background of the story. And so when the apostles, when they hear this news from the women that, that Jesus is risen, the angel has communicated that he is risen and the tomb was empty. We didn't even see Jesus. The reality is that the Bible says that to them it seemed as idle words and they believed them not. But look at verse number 12 because Peter, he actually goes and he looks into the tomb and he finds that the tomb is empty. He sees the linen wrapped there, right? But then notice what Peter happens to him as he leaves. The Bible says that he left wondering in himself. He's wondering, even Peter is wondering in himself that which had come to pass. And so no doubt, think about Peter, no doubt, as soon as he sees the tomb is empty, as soon as he sees the linens that had wrapped the Lord up, as, as soon as he sees that wrap, there's no doubt that in his mind's eye that he started thinking about his own doubt, his own confusion, his own discouragement, because just recently this man had denied Jesus three times. And so this morning, I want us to look at the continuation of what takes place. And so notice with me, beginning in verse number 13, notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one with another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? He says, Where have you been? He says, Aren't you a stranger in Jerusalem? And hast not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto him, what things? And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. 
But we trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yay! And certain women, certain women also of our company, made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they had found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels and said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, watch what he says, O fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for the resurrection and the life. We thank you for the hope of eternal life that we have through your son, Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would open up the eyes of our hearts today and the eyes of our understanding that we might be reminded that you truly sit high and lifted up that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords. And God, I pray that if there's somebody in this room that's discouraged, somebody maybe is confused, maybe someone is, quite honestly, still unsure as to whether you are the resurrection and the life, God, I pray that you would open up the eyes of their understanding as well. And God, I pray, as always, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. Because, Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. And I give you the praise for what you'll do over these next few moments of time. And I do so in the precious and powerful name of your son, Jesus, and for his sake. Amen. Well, as we begin to look at this passage, we really don't know too much about these followers of Christ. But if you noticed here in verse number 13, you'll see that the Bible does tell us that there are two of them and that one of them is named Cleopas. And all those many have tried to determine down through the ages, there's been a lot of theological thinkers who try to tell you who the other person was. The reality is nobody knows, save the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you're a theological thinker and you think you've already figured out that it was Peter or that it was Luke or that it was somebody else, I would just encourage you, you really don't know. You see, the reality is we don't know whether it was another man traveling with Cleopas. We don't know if it was Cleopas' wife. We don't know what the situation is. All we know is there's two uh, uh, people who were followers of Christ, and they're traveling. And so we see that they're confused. We see that they're disheartened by all that had taken place. And you can see that in, in our text, the past week for these two has been a blur I mean, you think what had begun at the beginning of the week with Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, people had been shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They had shouted that, but that week suddenly gave way. That week had suddenly gave way to his arrest, to his sham trial, to his crucifixion and burial. And so, as far as we know, the last time that these two individuals that were told about, beginning in verse number 13, the last time they had seen Jesus, he was dead. And so they're confused. Sadness had set in. All hope seemed to be lost. And when the rumors of his resurrection began, there was confusion and disbelief on the part of many. In fact, the apostles, I read to you, the apostles to them, even the women's testimony seemed as idle words. And so saddened and confused, what we know is in Scripture, the Bible tells us, and we don't know if this was their home or what the case was made, you know, maybe they just kind of wanted to get away. Have you ever wanted to get away? There are many times that I want to get away, right? You ever had that, just feel like, man, Lord, I just need to get away. They make their way to the village of Emmaus. What we know, the Bible says that this village was about three score furlongs. In other words, uh, this, this town, this village, if you please, was about seven and a half, between seven and a half, eight miles away from Jerusalem. And if you notice in verse number 14, uh, as we begin to work our way through the text, they're discussing all that had happened in Jerusalem over the past week. And in verse number 15, they're trying to come up with an explanation. They're literally talking with one another. They're trying to come up with an explanation as to why Jesus had died. 
And while all of this is going on, notice Jesus himself drew near and went with them. You know, it's been my experience in life, whenever I get confused, whenever I get discouraged, whenever I, I, I get to the point where I'm not sure what's going on, it seems as if, you know, it's like that poem, The, the Footprints in the Sand. You ever had that experience where you're looking for two sets of footprints and then all of a sudden you only realize that there's only one set. That's because those are the times that Jesus was carrying us. So Jesus, he draws nigh. He comes near to them. That's exactly what he does with us in seasons of our confusion. But notice in verse 16, I love this. It says that their eyes were holden. In other words, their eyes had been veiled. They had been covered in some way as the Ethiopic, uh, Ethiopic and Arabic versions state. In fact, the Persic version actually says that their eyes had been shut. In other words... Kind of like Greg with his cell phone. Had that cell phone on my body the whole time, but couldn't see it. Their eyes had been shut. They were veiled. They were held downward, if you please. Their eyes were so preoccupied with sorrow that as they trudged along, making their way to Emmaus. Have you ever been discouraged? Anybody been discouraged? Do you know the natural position of your head when you're discouraged? When you're disappointed? When we're victorious, we're like, yes! You ever been like that? But when you're discouraged, the head is down. You don't wander around. You're not looking at anybody. You're trying not to make eye contact with anybody. And so I don't know all the details, but the Bible says their eyes were holding so that they should not know that Jesus was Jesus. And so the reality is uh, these guys did not recognize him. But that kind of strikes a chord with me. Can you imagine walking with the Savior of the world and not knowing that you were walking with him? So many little nuances in this story. At any rate, being confused and discouraged, these two are making their way to Emmaus. Look at verse number 17. By the way, uh, a seven and a half hour journey, if you all want to, we can walk today. We can go out walking seven and a half miles. It's going to take you two hours or so if you're walking at a good clip, probably. Uh, maybe some of you can walk it faster. Some of you would take a little bit longer. But let's just give them an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half hours. They're walking and look at verse number 17. Although they don't know it's him, here comes Jesus. And he says... What manner of communications are these that you have one with another as you walk and are sad? Jesus knows all about your troubles. Isn't that what we just sang? He knows when you're sad. He knows when you're glad. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows when you got a bad attitude. Anybody got a bad attitude today? Jesus already knows all about it. The Bible says, he says, what are y'all talking about? He says, why are you so sad? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Can you imagine? Jesus, the resurrected Christ. He says, what's wrong with you guys? Why are you so sad? Why are you so discouraged? The reality is they were not only discouraged, they were sad. Look at verse number 18, Cleopas answers. He says, are you a stranger? He says, hello, where have you been? Are you been crawling out from under some rock? Where have you been? Don't you know why we're discouraged? We, we thought Jesus was him who was going to set us free. We had thought he was this. We had thought that he was that. We had thought that he was going to redeem Israel. That he was going to put an end to all the suffering. He was going to put an end to this and all the things that were taking place. Where have you been? Notice this is what they say. Verse 18 and 19. He says, are you a stranger? And he said, look at Jesus' answer. You think, so? you think he's got a sense of humor? He says, what things? What, what are y'all talking about? What do, you, what do you mean? What things have happened? Look, and they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Folks, if anybody knew what had taken place in Jerusalem over the last week, it was Jesus. They didn't need to clue him in, but remember, they don't know it's him. And so, I just think about the patience and love of our Lord. You know, we have a patient Lord. We have a loving Lord. 
Have you ever told Jesus something he already knows? It's like, it's like, Lord, you, 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 be careful of sticking your finger in God's face. But that's what we do. Whether you do it physically or not, when, when you start to tell God something as if he doesn't know what's going on in your life. Well, you didn't know this happened to me. You didn't know I'm going through this. You didn't know all these things. Listen, he knows all about our troubles. That's what we just sang, man. How perfect is that? He knows all about it. But I think about his love. And I think about his patience, not only with these two on the road to Emmaus, but with us every day. When we seek to tell him stuff that he already knows. The discussion they were having, by the way, stems from a huge misunderstanding. They had a huge misunderstanding which led to their disappointment and their discouragement, doubt and sadness. In fact, look at verse number 19, Cleopas now. Notice he refers to Jesus as a prophet, not Messiah, not the Christ, I thought you were a follower of Jesus. This is and two of them referencing the fact that after the women had seen the tomb, after Peter had seen the tomb, the very next verse says, and two of them, in other words, two followers of Christ, quote unquote, and now they say, ah, he was a prophet. Notice they're talking about past tense. Don't ever talk about Jesus in the past because he's present and he's forevermore. But they talk about him in the past tense. It seems as if they were looking. See, their, mis, their, their misunderstanding is they were looking for a political Messiah to take care of things. But notice in verse number 21, because Cleopas says, but we trusted that it had been, past tense again, we had trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. In other words, we were waiting on Jesus to become king. By the way, he did everything to become king. They just didn't understand it. They said, we wanted him to become king. I mean, think about it. The prophets had prophesied about a kingdom. The poets had pictured a kingdom. The angels pronounced a kingdom. Jesus himself had preached about a kingdom. And so these two had hoped and believed that Jesus was going to redeem Israel and that he was going to establish a kingdom. He was going to redeem them from Roman occupation and the rule that was over them. He was going to uh, redeem them from all of their misery, all of their poverty, all of their hunger, all of their disease, and all of their problems. He was just going to come and establish a kingdom. He was going to set himself on the throne. And he was going to right all of the wrongs that had been done to them. And if you and I are not careful, we become like those two travelers on our own road to Emmaus. Think about this. If we're not careful, we become like those two travelers on our own individual roads to Emmaus in which we get discouraged. In which we get sad, we get confused because Jesus didn't do this or that according to our desires. The truth is Jesus did exactly what was necessary to redeem Israel. And Jesus did exactly what was necessary to redeem all the whosoever wills that would ever be. Jesus had done what was necessary to turn not only their hurts and their habits and their hang-ups into eternal hallelujahs forevermore. He's done the same thing for us. Even though the women had testified about the empty tomb and the announcement of the Lord's resurrection and even though others had witnessed the empty tomb and, and actually some had seen him alive, the problem was not with their eyesight. Watch this. The problem wasn't with their eyesight. The problem was with their heart. And Jesus knew this. Look at our text back in verse 25. Drop down to verse 25. Jesus, see, when they say, don't, haven't you heard? Where have you been? What, what's going, don't you know what's been taking place about Jesus of Nazareth? Remember, he says, he says what, what, what things? He, he says, he's pretending as if he doesn't know. But by the time we get down to verse number 25, notice what Jesus says. He rebukes them. Instead of answering their question, he rebukes them and he says, Oh, fools, 
and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? He says, listen, your problem, your real problem is not your eyesight. Your real problem is doubt and unbelief. And like most of the Jewish people of that day, and even today, they saw Messiah as being this conquering redeemer, not a suffering servant. You see, they saw the glory, but they never saw the suffering. They saw the crown, but they never anticipated the cross. What they needed was God for open up the eyes of their heart. By the way, God's the one that opens up the eyes of the heart. And sometimes that's exactly when you and I get doubtful, when we begin to doubt, when unbelief begins to creep in, confusion, discouragement, sadness about this, that, or the other begins to creep in, what we need is for the Lord to come alongside and to remind us that he is the resurrected Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. That there is none beside him. That he is the one and only. The beginning and the last, right? We need him to remind us. We need him to open up the eyes of our heart. To tell us, listen, it's okay. Because I've already conquered the world. Oh, you you can be confident in what I've done for you. Oh, listen, this is what we need him to do. And so notice, again, he does exactly what he needs to do. Drop down to verse number 27 because the Bible reveals here. He goes again, Jesus does exactly what was necessary to do in their lives. Notice it says in verse 27, which I didn't read to you before, it says, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. You would have thought, time out for a second, you would have thought that, All he really had to do was say, hey guys, take a look. Hey guys, you see it? Could have had a Thomas moment, right? But here's the deal, folks. I believe it's a greater picture for us today. We don't have the physical Christ with us. But just as he did with them, we have his word. Do you see what he does? Look at verse 27. Guys, if you can put verse 27. He... He begins with Moses and all the prophets. And he begins to expound to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so what does Jesus do? He takes them to the word of God. Because without the word of God and the spirit of God, no hearts are getting opened. Did you hear me? Without the word of God and the spirit of God, no hearts are getting opened. In fact, the Bible confirms that. In Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17, the Bible says, So so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so when Jesus says, O fools, and slow of heart to believe, back in verse number 25, he's not making an assessment on their intelligence. He's actually drawing their attention to their greatest need. He says, guys... If it was all about you physically seeing me, I wouldn't have stopped you from being able to see me. It's not about seeing the physical. It's about understanding that I am who I say I am. It's about looking into the scriptures and understanding God's plan and God's purpose for that time when I had to suffer, when I had to die for your sins and the sins of the world. And so it seems, oddly enough, that the outward inability for these followers to recognize Jesus physically was a mirror of their inward doubt and unbelief. You know, sometimes when we don't see or sense the presence of God, maybe it's a sign of inward doubt or unbelief that is plaguing us. And this is what we see in the story. By the way, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7 that we are to walk by faith and not by sight. And so Jesus... Watch this pun. Jesus, the incarnate word of God, takes them to the word of God to open up the eyes of their heart. By the way, you say, what word of God? The word of God as they knew it at that time. He begins with Old Testament information. But my Bible tells you and I today in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12 that the word of God is quick and powerful and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. Listen, we have a living, breathing testimony of God's goodness to us today. 
Oh, listen, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy in chapter 3 and verse number 16, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And watch this, the Bible says it is profitable for doctrine. In other words, it's profitable for what's right. It's profitable for reproof. In other words, it's profitable to teach us what's not right. It's profitable for correction. In other words, it's profitable to teach us how to get right. And then it's also profitable for instruction in righteousness, which means it's profitable to teach you and me how to stay right so Jesus the incarnate word of God takes them to the word of God to open up the eyes of their heart the psalmist tells us in Psalm 119 and 105 thy word is a lamp under our feet and a light under our path and so verse 27 again beginning at Moses and all the prophets Jesus expounds unto them all the scriptures the things concerning himself And so his plan was not to reveal himself physically. His plan was to open up the eyes of their hearts spiritually. And so he explains the scriptures. He teaches them book by book. Can you imagine? I mean, I read a whole litany of lists and it would have taken too long to go through. Can you imagine on that couple of hour walk? Jesus says, well, back in this Garden of Eden, there was old devil, the serpent. God said one day he'd be squashed. Oh, that speaks of Jesus. And then he'd move on and he'd talk about Moses and, and he'd talk about Abraham and, and, the, and the ram that was in the thicket and the sacrifice that was going to be made. Oh, the God who provides. I guess he would have told him all that. And he goes on and on and he's expounding all these stories from, from one to another and showing them all the things that God's purpose concerning the Messiah would entail. <laughs> he used the word of God to point out God's plan and purpose In sending his son, watch this, the one sacrifice for sin forever. The one sacrifice for sin that would satisfy forever the sin debt that we owe and the sin debt that we could never pay on our own. If you're here today, you're watching online this morning, you're confused, you're discouraged. You're doubting. Maybe it's even, you're still doubting whether Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Maybe, maybe you sat here last week and you heard me talking about the tomb is empty. And I was telling people that we ought to get excited that the tomb is empty. And you're still doubting. You're still discouraged. Or maybe something else is going on in your life right now. And you're trying to figure out, you're confused about all the circumstances of your life. And you're trying to figure out, is Jesus real? I can tell you by the word of God, he is real. The Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 1, speaking of the gospel, he says this, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Look at verse number 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And verse number 4, he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Hallelujah. Oh, don't be confused. Don't be discouraged. Don't be disheartened because Jesus is alive. He has risen from the dead. The tomb is empty. There's no reason to be discouraged. There's no reason to be disheartened. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2, he tells us to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, as set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now watch what he says in verse number 3. Don't forget verse 3. For consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. You know what happens when we get discouraged and when we get confused and we start to doubt and we let unbelief creep in? That's exactly what we're doing. We're wearied in our minds. If you're weary this morning, go to verse number 3 of Hebrews chapter 12. Because the writer of Hebrews says, notice he says, for consider him. If you're weary this morning, consider Christ. 
who went to the cross, who died on the cross, who was buried in a borrowed tomb, who rose again three days later, conquering death, hell, and the grave for you and for me and for the sins of the world, for the whosoever wills of this world. What a Savior, a Savior we serve. In our, and in our text, it's kind of mind-boggling, but we find that the Word of God had impacted these two travelers so much that they wanted to hear more. How many people right now, this is my first message, I got two messages up here as well. We're going to have three more messages. How many want to hear more and stay? Yeah. yeah. A couple of you were serious, the rest of y'all were just brown nosing. You guys are. But what I find in my text is that these two discouraged, watch, Jesus said they were sad. So over a space, watch this, over a space of a couple of hours, maybe, maybe they're walkers. May, Kendra, maybe they're like you and Jackie, like they're, they're like power walkers, right? They're able to walk fast. Maybe they got that trip done in an hour and a half. But watch this. That was an hour and a half message with the Savior of the world. There ain't no preacher that contends with that. And the Bible tells me they actually wanted to hear more. Watch this, not because it was Jesus, they wanted to hear more of what this person was telling them. They wanted to hear more of God's word. They were moved, they were moved by the word of God and they wanted more. In fact, they invited him to stay with them. Look at verse 28 and following. Drop down to verse number 28. It says, and they drew nigh unto the village. So they're almost there to Emmaus. And whither they went, so they're on their way back to Emmaus, and he, Jesus, made as though he would have gone further. Now watch this. He's like, hey, it was nice chatting with you. I'll see y'all when I see you. He's moving on. He's, he's, he's making as if he's going to continue on. He's like, hey, I've done what I came to do. I've shared the word of God with you. I see that you're not discouraged. I see that you're not sad anymore. Y'all have a good night. I'm moving on. Notice verse 29. The Bible says, but they constrained him. In other words, they compelled him saying, abide with us for it is toward evening. And the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them, to tarry with them. That word tarry there means to stay. He went in to stay with them. Can I just say this before we go on? Don't jump ahead before we go on. They invited him to stay. Jesus ain't going to knock his way in. If you don't want him around, guess what? He'll get the message real quick like. And he'll keep on going down the road. But these two people, they were moved by the word of God. And so here's what they do. They say, we want more. Hey, it, 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 it's, it's evening time now. You, you can't be out on the road. Why don't you stay with us? Look at verse 30. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Verse 32, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened us to us the scriptures? Oh, the word of God that had been proclaimed to them by this traveler that they did not recognize. It was the word of God that had stirred the conviction and the burning of their hearts. And listen, sometimes in life, things do not happen the way we want them to. Sometimes things don't happen the way we expect them to. Sometimes things don't happen that we're ready for. But I got news for you. The way, the truth, and the life, the good, the great, and the chief shepherd of our soul will be with us through it all. By the way, when things don't happen the way we expect them, we have to be very careful. Because if we're not careful, 
We can be tempted by our adversary, the devil. We can be tempted by our flesh. We can be tempted by the wisdom of this world to doubt our Lord, to doubt the Lord Jesus Christ, to lose sight of him, just as those two travelers on the road to Emmaus had let confusion, discouragement, and sadness come in. But I put in my notes, when times like that come, here's the recipe for success. Stay in the Word. Are you discouraged today? Can I lovingly suggest, if you're discouraged, get into the Word. There's plenty of help for the discouraged heart. If you're sad today, can I encourage you, get in the Word. It was the Word of God that made a difference in the lives of these two travelers on the road to Emmaus. When times come where we're not expecting things to go the way that they go, can I tell you, not only stay in the Word, can I also encourage you to do something different? Maybe. And maybe, maybe you're a regular prayer, but maybe you're not. If it's been a while since you got down on your knees, it's okay. You know, they called James old camel knees. They called me, by the way, I'm the winner. I'm the winner of the 19. Lord of mercy. I have to go back in the, in the recesses of my mind. 1995, Gordon. Gordon knows what I'm talking about. I am the winner, by the way, of the Knobby Knees Contest. A silly game that young married couples play. I do not play that game anymore. I have grown. You know, it says when you're a child, all things are like a child. But I grew up, became a man, put away childish things. James was called camel knees. Why? Because he was always on his knees in prayer. When times come into our lives, and things happen that we don't expect to happen, and you begin to doubt, you begin to be confused or discouraged, unbelief begins to set in as to who Jesus is. Where are you? I don't see you. I don't sense you. Are you there? Are you with us, Lord? Can I encourage you, don't not only get in the Word, but could I encourage you to get on your knees and pray? Spend some time in prayer talking to the Lord. Oh, listen. You see, because it was the Word of God, and it's the time that we're able to talk with God, that's when He's going to open up the eyes of our heart to understand our spiritual eyes, what's going on. But all of that, look at, look at verse 33, because I want you to see the dramatic results. I mean, this story's great, but look at the dramatic results in verse 33. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. Hold on a second. You all just walked seven and a half miles that way, but the Word of God stirs your heart takes you from sadness to gladness, Jesus blesses and breaks the bread, your eyes are open, you're like, what? That's Jesus. And what is the first thing they do? They don't say, oh, well, let's sleep on it. Let's get some vittles. Let's have a good night's sleep. We're going to go back tomorrow and tell everybody that we actually saw Jesus. No. Seven and a half. That's a 15-mile journey. By foot, the same day. They get on their high horse and they get back to Jerusalem. Now watch this. Watch it. Look at verse 33. They return to Jerusalem. And when they get there, they got to find the others. They find the others gathered together and them that are with them. And notice what's going on. When they get there, the others are already having their own party. They're already saying, look at verse 34. They're saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has already appeared to Simon Peter. Oh, they're having a holy party. They're getting excited. They're hallelujah and left and right. And here come these two guys, this, this husband and wife, whoever the travelers are, and they come in, they're like, what's going on? What's going on? Everybody, you got they, They're like, be quiet. He's risen indeed. Now watch verse 35, because in verse 35, they finally get their chance. Listen, they're so filled with excitement. And the Bible says, and they told what things were done in the way. 
and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. They were so filled with excitement, they couldn't wait. They rose up, they immediately make the trek back. The others are already gathered. They're already talking about the fact that, they, that Jesus has risen indeed. Peter's already seen him. It's a big party back in Jerusalem. And then in verse number 35, they get the opportunity, watch, and it says, and they told all the things which were done in the way and how he was known. Folks, it's one thing to say the Lord is risen. It's another thing to say he is risen indeed. It's another thing to say and to know and to believe and to proclaim that Jesus is risen indeed. You see, it's one thing to, to talk about it. It's another thing to know it and declare it. And here's what I put in my message here. Listen, when you know and believe that Jesus is truly risen, it's going to impact the way you think. When you know, when you know and believe that Jesus is risen indeed, when you know it, when you feel it, when you believe it to your core, it's not only going to impact the way that we think, it's going to impact the way that you speak. And when you know, and you believe, and you can proclaim that Jesus is risen indeed, it's not only going to impact the way you think and the way you speak, it's going to impact what you do. Can I tell you, there is a world outside of these doors that need to know and believe that Jesus Christ is risen indeed. And if we don't tell them, if we don't tell them, I got news for you, nobody will. If we don't tell them, nobody will. We've got, to, we've got to have this mindset. We can't let the discouragement, we can't let the sadness, the confusion of this life. And when things don't happen the way that we think they ought to happen according to our desire, according to our plan, when those things don't happen like that, we can't let that stifle us. We have to be of the mindset that says, He is risen indeed, therefore I will not be silent. I must go out and tell everybody. I must go out and think uh, as a follower of Christ. I must speak as a follower of Christ. I must do that which I am commanded to do which is to carry the gospel to the uttermost part of the world beginning right here at home aren't you glad for Jesus I am too I pray if you're here today and you don't know Christ do not leave this place if you're watching online listen you get in touch with us our phone numbers are on the website you get in touch with us do not Turn off the, uh, the, the feed. Do not walk out of here without Jesus today. Without knowing that he is risen indeed. If you're here and you already know that, then I want to challenge you. Similar to what I challenged you with last week. If you know that he's risen indeed, and you believe that he's risen indeed, I'm challenging you that you would be just as those right out of the gate when they said go and tell. Go and tell others that you believe that and that what he has done for you in changing your life. Oh, what an opportunity we have today. All because, all because God has opened the eyes of our heart. Father, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity that we've had to be here today. And God, I pray that you've been honored and glorified through this this message from your word, this reminder. God, I pray that it reminds us that your word is powerful. It is a living, powerful, sharp instrument that we can use, God, to find encouragement when we are discouraged. Your word is what brings about the opening of our eyes and our heart with your spirit. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to rely on your word and your spirit as we go from this place. And Lord, I pray that above all that you would be honored and glorified during this time of invitation. I pray that you would give people boldness to step out from their comfort zone. 
maybe, maybe there's somebody that doesn't know Christ as their Savior today, that they would step out wanting to know, wanting to hear more from your word, and that we'd be able to take them and show them from your word how they could know that they could know they have a home in heaven. God, help us to be people that bring you honor and glory. We'll give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen.